Welcome to The Drawing Board. I am your host and in-house artist, Darren Leffler. If you're not familiar with The Drawing Board, here's a quick rundown on what happens on the show. Every episode of The Drawing Board, I invite a guest from the comics and entertainment industry, and we learn a little bit more about what they do. And while learning about what they do, I'm also drawing them. Pretty fun, right? Well, my guest this week has done so many amazing things in the entertainment industry. From acting on Broadway in shows such as She Loves Me and Aladdin, doing voiceovers, again, for a movie that you may know called Aladdin from Disney, and doing things as puppeteering, he's done pretty much everything you could think of and has been nominated for a Tony. Please welcome my guest, Jonathan Freeman. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. I'm good, Aaron. So, for the kids who don't know some of the terms I just used, because there were a little couple big ones in there, how would you describe what you do? I would say that first I would describe my say that I'm an actor. Um, I have worked as an actor, though. I've worked in other facets of uh, the industry besides just acting in plays. I have worked uh, on Broadway, off-Broadway. I've done television series. I've uh, done film. I was, uh, I've been done documentaries, um, just about everything. But I guess I would, I guess I would say that um, more than anything, I would just say I'm an actor. And uh, I do a lot of voice work. I do uh, voices for animated characters. And um, also I, I was the voice for six seasons of a puppet character on a show called Shining Time Station. That is really cool. For those of you of a certain age. <laughs> I'm sure that some of the people who are watching this have seen it. Maybe. But that's really neat. And if I heard correctly, you're one of the only people to play the same role on Broadway that you played in an animated film. I think I'm the only person to ever have taken their uh, animated character to another medium. So, that is amazing. Uh, any medium, yeah. That's what, that's what I was told, so I'm sticking to it. Well, that's really cool, and that's got to be such a cool achievement for your career. Well, it's interesting because it's a character, you know, Jafar is a great character. Uh, it's a character now that's been with me since 1991 when I started work for Disney on the project. And, you know, uh, it's never re he's never really gone away. I've sort of been time traveling with this um, imaginary um, uh who's become less and less imaginary as the years have gone on, by the way. This imaginary character uh, for all these years now. Now, it seems like you've had such an amazing career and gotten to do so many different things. How long have you been doing this? Well, um, I started when I was a kid, really. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and there's a, the oldest regional theater in the United States called the Cleveland Playhouses there. So I worked as a kid uh, in children's theater in, in Cleveland uh, at the Cleveland Playhouse. Um, there were several theaters there I worked in, uh, Kane Park Amphitheater, uh, Children's Theater on the Heights. There's another theater called the Caramu House. There was a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of different things, uh, uh, a lot of different places that I worked uh, as a kid. And I sort of just kept at it. And then I went to, uh, I had a great, a great teacher named Marilyn Bianchi uh, when I was uh, probably in my early teens. And uh, she sort of was the first person to let us know, I say us, I mean the people that were in my classes with me, that, you know, it, if, if you wanted it to be more than just a lot of fun, it could also be a career at some point in your life. And I kind of just kept doing it. It gave me a lot of pleasure. And I loved the things I was doing. And a lot of the things I was doing then actually have turned out to be the roles <laughs> I'm doing now uh, for various reasons. And, um, and so that's that, that's what happened. And then I, I continued, I went to, to school and studied and I became a junior member of Actors' Equity at some time in my late teens. And by the time I was 20, I was a, a member of Equity and moved to New York City in 1972, and that's it. So it seems like you've been doing this for a while. You said you've been doing this as a kid, so I can imagine you've had a lot of amazing influences in your career and in your life. For you, what were, what were some of those people or those things that really influenced you that made you say, like, this is what I want to do? Yeah, there were a lot of them. There still are a lot of them, but uh, in the beginning of, of my interest in theater and film and TV and uh, I think I was attracted to character actors. I was always attracted to character actors who played bigger than life 
characters who played unusual, bizarre, idiosyncratic, strange, villainous characters. I, I was always attracted to those characters. And of course, uh, most people uh, start watching Disney animated movies when they're young. So all of those characters were interesting to me. All the bigger than life characters, larger and larger in scale, that is. Um, they were all interesting to me. And the people that played those characters were usually important character actors at the time. I didn't realize it because to me, you know, the voice of, of Captain Hook and the, the image of Captain Hook was, were synonymous. And it happened to be an actor named Hans Conried, who I admired and he went on to do, a, had a huge career. Most people that did those voices had huge careers. And I don't know if people realize that or not. They, a lot of them had big careers before they worked at Disney. A lot of them had big careers during and after too. And it's only, you know, years later that I discovered that oh, the voice of, of uh, Maleficent was also the woman on the I Love Lucy shows who was the head of some ladies committee or something. You know what I mean? So you, I sort of, it, it got sewn together over the years. So those were my influences, all the character actors. I had the great fortune to meet a man named Eric Rhodes, who was in all of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies, which is before my time. But he was, uh, when I, when I met him, he had long stopped doing those movies, of course, but he's a wonderful character actor and I got to be friends with him. Um, I don't know, there's just, there has always been something about the character, the, the men's characters, particularly, of course, because uh, that's the stuff that I'm asked to play. But I have to say a lot of, a lot of the uh, women character actresses too were very attractive to me. Um, they, you know, they, they just, they were interesting. They were, they were interesting in that I always felt that those characters there was a lot to look at. Um, they always looked like they were having the most fun. <laughs> they have the best wardrobe. I don't know. <laughs> you know, everything, everything about those characters seemed interesting to me. Um, they always had, you know, pets that could talk. <laughs> Who doesn't want that, you know? Oh, yeah. I know when I was a kid, I always wanted a pet that would talk back to me. <laughs> Right? I know. I used to have these conversations with my grandmother's pet, whose name was Freckles. It was a cocker spaniel. And I was sure that he was listening to me. <laughs> you know, I think also Disney kind of gave kids that assumption when they started showing that toys could talk in Toy Story. They made kids think like, oh, look, stuff can talk to you back. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a kid, though, you know, you have a very rich, full fantasy life. I, I think most kids do. And I think that you do even if you don't even if it doesn't come out of your mouth even if you don't actually verbalize it um i think you have conversations in your head with you know toys your own toys and uh pictures and books inanimate objects and things i don't know i remember talking to things inanimate objects uh i think i, I used to have a name for our vacuum cleaner and i can't remember it now i'm trying to find out my mother said, "God, I don't remember that." Anyway, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that that's true. So that, anyway, so that was that was that's part of it. Yes, talking pets. I love that. That's awesome. You know, it's great to hear like having such a rich, you know, role models from people who already played roles like that you further went into in your life and got into playing and everything. That's amazing to have that as your inspiration. Yes. So, yeah. mm -hmm. along with that just like these people who inspired you, you've gone on to play characters that have become widely known and loved around the world, whether it be in animated films, whether it be in theater. Mm -hmm. And you have kids out there who either know your voice or have seen you on stage playing these mm -hmm. roles. So what's it like knowing that a kid may be listening to you or seeing you and saying, that's something I want to do? Yeah, you know, it didn't, none of that, everything that you just described is, is kind of true, but it didn't really happen until I, until I did Aladdin, I think. It kind of put me on the, the world map with kids, because I meet kids from all over the world. Um, I, it, was, it was very strange. I mean, first of all, it was very strange the first time that they showed me a piece of rough, rough pencil test of Jafar in, in one of the early scenes and my voice coming out of the character that Andreas Deja had animated. I mean, I had gotten to be good friends with my animator because I was very interested in, in animation, period. I always have been. Um, animation uh, always 
just thrilled me. I think it's because animated characters can do things that you can't do in real life. You know? <laughs> and so, I mean, you can jump off a cliff in an animated movie and your character can be suspended in midair for quite a long time before he actually falls, things like that, you know. Um, so that, so it was interesting to me that the kids even uh, responded uh, to those voices. And then I thought, well, that's not, why is that so weird to you? You responded to those voices. I just think that, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't have the same kind of access the kids have now. I mean, I can do a Zoom, I can do a FaceTime, I can do these chats that, that schools set up, um, you know, and this is just recent because of the, of the current um, situation with the virus. But I mean, I would go into schools and I, uh, with uh, other friends from Aladdin and um, we often did little seminars and things like that. It's interesting. It's very interesting and it's exciting. With really young kids, I used to, if they wanted me to say some Jafar line or something, I'd always ask them to please close their eyes. Because otherwise, I discovered that kids, young kids especially, would look at you like you were a total imposter. Like <laughs> say, this is Jafar. Jafar, can you say something for Johnny, you know? And you'd say some Jafar line, and they'd look at you like, what are you, kidding me? You're not him. <laughs> like, where's the hat? Where's the bird? Where's the fire? Where's the staff, you know? Like, I was total imposter. So I used to say to kids, um, well, listen, I'd be happy to do this for you, but I want to ask you to close your eyes. I want you to act, I want to ask you to, you know, use your imagination and, and try to remember what Jafar actually looks like. And it usually worked out better, to be honest. Telephone conversations were good for that reason. I can imagine. It's probably hard for a kid to grasp that there's a person behind the animated character. Yes. I think for I think that it's I think for really young kids, they actually don't. It's just like seeing an animated character is like seeing an actor. It's the same thing. It's like I, I just don't think that there's a big, you know, it takes a long time before they realize, oh, that's a piece of art. It's hand drawn and this is an actual person. And especially when you watch things on the same screen all the time now, it's not like, you know, you can watch an actor on your television screen or on your video screen or on your telephone now, and you can watch them uh, on, on the stage. You can watch them in a, a TV show or a film or you can watch an animated movie and it's all the same. It's on the same size screen. So why, didn't, why wouldn't it all be the same? I guess I mean, there's some logic there that I probably am not being able to be very logical about, but I know it's there. No, I love it. That's a great answer. And I think that's something that's, you know, widely overlooked because everything to us is so deceptively simple when we see it on screen. It just, it's there. So we don't ever think about all the work that goes into it. No, no. And, and you know, with an animated movie, you know, at that time, uh, computer animation was just beginning. They only used a little bit of computer animation in Aladdin. And so the work was incredible. Uh, most people are, are amazed when you say to them, well, the animation is, is at the final animation is the last thing to be done. People think that, that they animate a movie and then you sort of voice, you voice over. Um, but if you think about it logically, you know, editing would be a nightmare then because they would be editing out hours and hours and hours of valuable and expensive time. So all the editing is done in the voicing process. And then once they have the script that they want on paper, and all the voicing that they want, uh, you know, recorded, and they can look at the progress of a scene or of the movie through frame-by-frame uh, -frame stills that the artists have drawn, then they start animating. It's a very, it took years. I, I, were, I personally worked a year and nine months on Aladdin on and off. And um, I know that the, the research people and the animators start working a long time before they even bring actors in. Now, I have to bring this up because it's very interesting. You've done so many different avenues in the entertainment industry from doing voiceovers to doing theater, but also doing puppetry. Now, that's not one that you often hear with entertainment. So what's that like? You know, when I was really young, uh, I think I told you I grew up in Cleveland and the, the wonderful Cleveland Museum of Art was there and they had... Um, it's, it's, it's just a fabulous museum and they, they had classes on uh, Saturdays probably and one of the classes was with a guy named George Latshaw, who was a very well-known puppeteer. And I, um, I had an interest in puppets as a kid, you know, just 
in playing with them and doing shows, of course, for my friends and family in the Jonathan Freeman Backyard Summer Theater. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, I guess m one of my parents must have said, you know, we should enroll in one of these classes and, you know, and it was a fantastic experience and it kind of stayed with me. And then when I, when I moved to New York for the first time, my first three professional jobs in New York were with puppet companies, the Niccolo Marionette Theater. Um, I worked in the uh, puppet theater in Central Park in the summer for two seasons. And then I auditioned for the Bill Baird Marionette Theater. Bill Baird was a very famous puppeteer and had his own beautiful theater on Barrow Street. And we did, um, we did these productions there that were financed in part by the Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein Foundation. I did a musical version of Pinocchio that Richard Ro that um, Sheldon Harnick and Mary Rogers did the music and lyrics for. So it was a very fertile way to make a living for me doing puppets, you know, creating these characters. And uh, it was it was not, you know, in a sense, I think, I guess it was not that not that far away from doing animation, except that I had more hands on with the puppets. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of that. And then um, I did uh, a season called Shining Time Station on PBS, which was uh, a show that had been uh, uh, connected to Thomas the Tank Engine and it took place in a train station and people would put nickels into a jukebox and once they put their nickels in to get their song played, they'd cut to the inside of the jukebox and there would be actual people in there who were puppets that would play the songs that people requested. And they had, you know, banter. They had some scenes between themselves and they would have some scenes with um, Ringo Starr and George Carlin, who were the two successive station masters. They would pop into the, you know, through the magic of television, they would pop into the jukebox and talk to the puppets and stuff. So, yeah, I, I, so I did a lot of puppeteering there and that was a great time. And I did a lot of other sort of pilot projects for um, uh, puppet projects and I worked with wonderful people with the Flextune Company and, um, and with Bill Baird. I think the first thing I did with Bill Baird actually was a commercial for something and I can't remember what and a, a pilot for a series called Hello New Place. I mean, these are long forgotten and long gone things, but they were a big, a big part of my life for a long time. And um, I, I, I did it on and off and I, you know, will still do it. I would still do it if somebody asked me to do it and I, it was something that I felt was a, a something that I wanted to do. I personally find it so fascinating because I grew up with Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers always had puppets on his show, but it seems like the art of puppetry, unless it's like the Muppets, has been totally lost in entertainment. So it's really cool to get to talk to somebody who's actually done it. I think you're right. Um, although hopefully it's not been totally lost, but you're right. It, it's sort of been something about Jim Henson's Muppets that are so, ex are so, uh, they're so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Accessible to kids, the personalities of them and the way they look, they're, they're easy, they're, they're, they're fun, they, they really draw you in, their personalities draw you in, you know. But Jim Henson, you know, his, his early years were informed by a lot of other puppeteers. There was a, uh, Kukla, Fran and Ollie was a, a television show for a while that was a puppet show and, and a, a, an early TV puppet show. And, and even if you look at early Jim Henson stuff, he, he did a, he had a, he had something on television before he was really the Muppets and they were wonderful too. All of that stuff was wonderful. So I don't know, it's been around for a long time. It is an ancient art. I mean, people say the first puppet was, was uh, manufactured when a caveman took a skull of some horned creature and put it on a stick and held it in front of a fire and his shadow went up against the wall behind him and they were able to do these kind of shows. So, um, you know, I love doing marionettes, which is something that is, is not done very much um, anymore, but it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful art form. And uh, again, it's very closely related to doing voiceovers, except that you actually have more physical contact with the character. You know, you're a little divorced with animation um, unless, you, unless you really impose yourself as I did on your animators and your directors and stuff, uh, just because I was, I was always enchanted by animation.
Now, with shows like The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance coming back, where they're actually using real puppeteers, there has been some talk that there might be a little bit of puppetry brought back into the entertainment mainstream. So what's that like knowing that, and would you ever want to do something like that again? Sure. Oh, God, yeah. It's great. I mean, I think it's wonderful. And I think that, that um, you know, the, the, just the fact that, I mean, that puppets can have a big... I don't know if it is a big, but it is a chunk of the entertainment industry is kind of interesting. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting to me. It takes, I'll tell you what, it takes a lot of strength to be a puppeteer, whether you're holding a puppet up over your head or whether you're up on a bridge working a marionette control and leaning down over on top of the stage. Uh, it, take, it takes a lot of strength and um, I would still love to do it. I haven't done it in a long time. I'd always be happy to lend a voice, but you know, when you're puppeteering, uh, it's, it is so great to be able to be able to be doing the voice too, because it's more organic. It's easier for you to make the puppet seem like the voice that you're creating and the words that you're saying are actually coming out of that puppet's mouth if you're actually the one that's doing the bapping. <laughs> While that, it's called a bap opening on vowels, closing on consonants. When you, when you do that and you talk at the same time, it becomes very connected. So when you, can, when you have the chance to integrate those two things, it's, it's great, you know. Um, I know a lot of people have done voices for, you know, puppet characters that have not been puppeteers and not been puppeteering, but it really is, it's better the other way. Now, you've had the opportunity to work in many different facets of the entertainment field, which means you've also had a lot of experience with different things that happen in the entertainment field. We all kind of go through it, no matter what branch we're in, whether we're artists, musicians, writers, or actors, we all face rejection at times. Mm. Do you think that's something that kids can learn from, or is that something that they should take personally? No. Uh, yes, of course you can learn from it, and... Um I mean, it is personal, but you shouldn't take it personally, if that makes sense. Um, here's what I think about that. If you're talking about rejection, about auditioning for a role and not getting it, usually if that happens, it's just not your role, you know? And, and the thing about that, there's some wisdom to that. People used to say, you know, you... Um, Every time you lose a role, it means you're, you're one step closer to getting the role that you're supposed to have. So there's, there's something to that. Um, you, can always, you can always learn, you know, when you're rejected, I think, because it, 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 it sort of forces you to cross-examine yourself. And what did I do? What did I do wrong? What did I do right? And I think, you know, I think it's very valuable as long as you don't beat yourself up with it because things happen the way they're gonna happen. And, you know, we have some control over certain things, but we don't have, we don't have control over everything. So, so you have to let your, you do have to let go of things. Um, but it is, you know, you, you, always, you always learn from mistakes. I think when I work with a director, for example, the best directors that I work with and by the way, when I teach classes, I try to do what I'm about to tell you, which is that the best directors that I've worked with are directors that allow you to fail in the rehearsal room. That's your opportunity to make mistakes. Same thing when you're studying to be an actor, if, you, if you're studying to be an actor, you know, the, the, the classroom is the place to make mistakes, to, if you can let go of your ego, which is a hard, things sometimes and not feel like you're being judged by it and you shouldn't be judged by it that's the place that you that's the place that you are supposed to be doing these things uh making mistakes being foolish um falling on your face because it's a safe place it's safe to fail in a classroom it's safe to fail when you're in rehearsals and you know let's face it if you can if you can have a few of those failures and know that those were bad choices then it helps you get to the good choice I mean, sometimes in order to get to the best choices, the best acting choices, you have to go through some bad choices. No, so, absolutely. 
So I think it's all valuable. You know, when, when kids say, well, what's the most important thing? I say, everything's important. <laughs> <laughs> everything is important you know how you process the information is is another thing but um i think if you if you can if you have the facility to listen to everything to look at everything and to absorb as much as you can there's nothing wrong with that it all well, along those lines it seems like there's a spirit of competition that gets bred when you're going up for a role or if you're trying to get a job because there's other people who want the same job as you Right. Do you find that it's easier to be competitive with these people or do you find that it's better to kind of like create a group of fellow creatives you can learn from? Oof. Well, that feeling of competition is, I think it's, that's something natural. I, I don't think it's that easy to just deny that in yourself. I think that, you know, if you're, listen, I, I can remember and it still happens going in. I, well, I can tell you, that um, when I was auditioning for Aladdin, you know, I had an audition and it was just in a room with a casting director and uh, a reel to reel tape recorder because that's how they used to record things in those days. And my pianist who, uh, who, who played us because I, I had to sing and I also had to do some scene work. When I went back for my second audition, there were several people waiting to go in and I looked at them and I thought, oh, that person looks more like Jafar, they'll probably get it. I think that these, these thoughts that come into your head, <laughs> you know, you, you can't avoid it. And you can't avoid, you know, thinking, oh, I hope so-and-so doesn't get it. Or, you know, it, 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 first of all, it creates bad feelings and it's not helpful. Um, I, you often find too, when you're auditioning, at, at certain stages in your life, you do audition with a lot of the same people. And the reason is because you're all, you have something in common, which is either your age, your youthful beauty, your personality. There's something about you that has brought, you know, let's say the five of you in to audition for the same role. And um, the best thing that I think you can do is to be authentic is to be as authentic as you can be, audition for something as well as you can, and then you really have to try to walk out of there and, you know, put it away. It's not an easy thing to do. It's oh, that's really a great easy. piece of advice. Well, it is good advice, you know, but good advice, you know, doesn't sound kind of help you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> it it doesn't, but sometimes it's always good to have that in the back of our minds. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing. The day ends, let's say you had, a, even let's say you had a terrible audition. You think, oh, I'll never get that. Well, I've had terrible auditions. I've been called back. Um, the day ends and then a new day begins. And it just, it, there's this, there's sort of this forward motion that keeps happening. And, and you only have a career kind of in retrospect. Like you look back and you're like, wow, I did a bunch of stuff, you know? Um, so you just got to keep going. And, you know, good attitude helps. And everybody understands when you get down on yourself about stuff, too. You just have to, I think, I think it's okay. Like, do it, process it, and then move on. That is a great thing to remember. And thank you so much for sharing that. I don't think I'm the first person to have come up with that, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, but I have had so many different answers on here. So it's always great to hear different oh, okay. people say different things. Yeah. So non-serious question here, because this is something I get asked a lot at Comic-Cons, and I feel like it's an important thing that we bring up and talk to kids about. Mm -hmm. Kids feel a lot of times that they have to put everything into their job and that everything has to be about work 24-7 and that they can't show off if they like something or if something, if they're a fan of something. So for you, do you find that it's hard to kind of like separate, you know, personal life from your work? And do you find that it's unprofessional like things or... Mm -hmm. It gets easier, I think. I think it gets easier when you mature, when you get older. I think you, it's easier for you to say, oh, look, this is real life and that's my job, or this is real life and that's just my work right now. And I, I do think it gets easier separated. It, it's, it's not so easy. It is sort of integrated. I mean, especially if, if you're an actor, if you're an artist, if you're a writer, if you're a songwriter, I mean, it's, it's, it's connected to you. It's not like you are going to an office and your 
writing insurance policies or something. And those insurance policies are, are work that you do and you may do very well. I'm not, you know, I'm not putting down uh, insurance underwriting or anything, but um, it's a, that is more of a, a job, I guess. It's, it's a little less personal and maybe that's the difference. Maybe it's the, because certain of these, certain of these other things we've talked about are very personal creative, the creative, uh, occupations. I don't know. You, you put a lot of you, you put a lot of you into your work. And so it, it is, gets a little hard to separate, but you really must, you really must separate it. I think, you know, I, I, I have a private and personal life and I try to keep it, you know, at bay if I can, because it's nice to have a, a place to go, a soft place to fall when you need to. And if it's all the same, then you don't have another place to go to. So I think it helps. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. And I think that's very important to be able to separate things. So Listen, I'm sure that there are huge stars from the past and in the present now who are, it's just all about their career. I'm not sure. I think there may be people, I should say it, I should say it that way. There may be people who, who have that kind of life where it's all, you live your life at, you know, a hundred miles an hour every day, but that's not me. <laughs> so a couple more questions for you before I show you what I was able to finish while you were talking. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you one thing about these interviews It's a little difficult sometimes to, um, it's distracting to be talking about something. And then I, then I, cause it's like, I, if I were there, I could look over your shoulder or something, <laughs> but I can't. So it does, it does kind of get a little bit. That's the fun little mystery of it. <laughs> Yes. Yes, but it's distracting too. I mean, I, I hope I, I have I have times where I like go sort of lose my track of what I was talking about, and I think it's because I I kind of veer off into your uh, pad. Well, are you doing that? Um, oh, is that it's electronic or something? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. you've done so many cool things from. One of my favorite shows on Broadway, you were in She Loves Me, and you also have done Aladdin on Broadway and so many other amazing shows. You've done the puppetry, you've done voice acting. Mm -hmm. You've gotten to work with so many different people. Mm. So I'm sure this is probably going to be a harder question than I think it would be. But given the chance, if you were able to work with anyone on anything that you wanted to, that you haven't done already, what would you do? Well, I presume that means that these people still have to be alive and with us <laughs> because they're, I they're mean, it could be with somebody that you wished you could have worked with. Oh, there are, Oh, Aaron, we don't have time. <laughs> no, really. I, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of, of actors that I have such respect for and, and I would love to have worked with them. And there's actors that are alive that I'd love, love to work with. I mean, you'll never get to work with everybody. It's like, it's like being able to go everywhere in the world and in your lifetime. I mean, it's almost impossible. It always seems when you're young, like, Oh, I'll be able to go. I'll, I'll visit every city in the world and I'll go in. And it, well, no, I don't know if that's even possible. Anyway, um, there are a lot of people that I've worked with. I will say this, that the people that I like working best with, and there are a few people that I've worked with uh, several times, um, sometimes by accident, sometimes by choice, I like the people that I have developed a shorthand with so that I don't feel like I have to explain everything. And I think that's one of the reasons that people end up working with people time and time again, instead of, you know, they're like, why, don't, why didn't they choose me? They, cho they already worked with that person before, you know. Um, I, think, I think it has a lot to do with the shorthand that you develop if you've had a good experience in the past and you want to work with them again, you know, um, there are a few people that I've done uh, several projects with. Um, I would love to, you know, I'm speaking of actors now and directors and choreographers. There's always, um, you know, the choreographer for She Loves Me. I'm glad you like that show, by the way. It's such a beautiful, beautiful show. That was one of my all time best experiences and I have had a lot of good experiences but that was really a lovely experience and I got to work with the greatest people Judy Kuhn and Boyd Gaines and Howard McGillan and Louis Zorich 
Sally Mays. And I mean, it was just, it was an unbelievable company. And it will always stay with me as one of the high points of my life. Not because I got nominated, all that, well, that was pretty nice. But it was just a kind of a perfect, perfect show it, it just all came together perfectly and the design tony walton's design and and jane greenwood's costumes and oh god I, I could go on and on about it it's just beautiful it's a beautiful show uh and um i would like to work with any of those people again i'd like to work with everybody that i worked with on aladdin again uh I'd like to work with a lot of people that I worked with in most of the shows that I did. And I really was lucky early in my career when I was in my 20s to work with people who had one foot firmly rooted in another time in, in, in theatrical and movie history. I did a, a musical in 1979 with an actress named Alexis Smith, a beautiful actress from the 40s. She mostly had a lot of films she did in the 40s. She was a Paramount actress and she did a Broadway musical. And at that time, it was the first musical. It was produced by Paramount and we rehearsed on the Paramount lot. And at the time, Michael Eisner was the head of Paramount. All these things have changed over the years, you know. Michael Eisner then went to Disney and I don't know. Anyway, so... I'm, I'm always interested in working with people again that have been terrific. I, I'm not going to name a lot of names because I don't want to leave people out either. But um, a lot of the people that I looked up to, Jimmy Coco was one of them who was long gone. And there was a woman named Jodie Goodman that I did a show. Fantastic actress, actors and actresses. And they were just terrific. Well, that was a and lovely I, answer. You learn a lot. You know, you learn a lot from people if you, if you let yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, last question for you. Given, you know, if a kid's watching this right now, in any avenue that you've done, whether it be puppetry, whether it be stage acting, voice acting, screen acting, if they wanted to get into any of that and they took one thing away from the stuff that you've said today, what would you want them to walk away with knowing? Oh, brother. That's not an easy question. I ask tough questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't want to give. I don't want to give people bad. You know, it's, well, it's tough because you don't want to give people bad advice. I think you know. I think that if you're, I think you always have to follow your heart, and you, you really have to listen carefully. You know, we all have a voice in our heads, a, a little voice that, that tells us things. It sometimes is that same voice that tells us, you know. If something's a bad, if something's a bad idea or a good idea, and tells us tells us if it's right from wrong or whatever. But I think you really have to listen to yourself. You have to listen to your head. You have to listen to your heart. You have to, and you have to be pragmatic. You have to be very practical about things. I think too, uh, and that's not easy. I. I think the I think the best thing is to be is to be to to listen to yourself and to be authentic because when you walk into a room to meet people if you're trying to have a career whatever you're doing and you're and you're what you are I mean you're authentically you I I don't think you can go wrong because that's what you have to offer that's the best thing you have to offer too and it's a good thing it's the best thing I don't know I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much for saying that. That's going to be a great thing for kids to hear, I think. So now comes the fun part where I get to show you what I was able to make off of you while you were saying all these wonderful things. I hope that the computer doesn't skew the colors because it does sometimes. Let's see if I can get that up there. Oh, well, that's funny. I, you made me look much more handsome. No! Much, yes, you did. Let's no. see. Let me see that again. Let's see if I can get that back up in there. Oh, that's, is that my nose? No, that's a much nicer nose. No, it's not. Your nose is good. That's lovely, Erin. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you and to hear your stories and learn from you today. And thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. Again, I am your host and in-house artist, Erin Leffler. Catch you next time on The Drawing Board.
don't have one of those things yet, but I'm going to use my hands. That signifies mm -hmm. good. <laughs>